Okay, so we're good. Hopefully you guys can all see me. So uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for taking your time to to watch this presentation. Uh, so I'm going to be introducing our next gen Kali tools. So a rough overview of this talk is I'm going to describe what is next gen Kali so far. I will briefly introduce our team. I'll talk about uh, how next gen Kali compares to some other toolkits out there. And I'll also to talk about our vision for the future and what it is we're trying to do. And I'll, I'll talk about why should you use it possibly and how, how would you use it? And if there's time at the end, I'm going to summarize some of our recent uh, technical work. So, okay. Probably some of you have seen this before. So next gen Caldi is an umbrella term for these, uh, these different tools. Uh, there's load C that does data preparation for speech tasks. There's K2 that contains a bunch of core algorithms in C++ and CUDA. And Icefall is the top level recipes. Uh, and Icefall uses K2 and load C. Uh, so here's some pictures of our team. So uh, Icefall and uh, K2 are mostly developed here at Xiaomi, and this is a picture of our team as it currently stands. Uh, most of Lotzi is actually written by Piotr Zelasko, who's based right now in the USA. Here's his uh, picture, but we we contribute to to uh, to Lotzi, and other people also contribute to uh, our tools from outside uh, Xiaomi. Uh, so, what other toolkits can we compare? Next gen Caldi too. There's the original Caldi. Uh, some of, and some of the popular toolkits nowadays are SpeechBrain, ESPNet, and WeNet. At least those are the ones that I hear most about. I don't want to imply that other toolkits are not good, but these are the ones I mostly mostly hear about. Uh, I'll I'll try to explain the differences in approach. Uh, so. The term end to end comes up a lot these days and people ask, is next gen Caldi end to end? Well, you can't really answer that question unless you first, uh, can say what end to end really means. Now, a way to define end to end that seems to fit how people use that term is it's end to end. If you can implement the training in Python with only PyTorch and TensorFlow primitives, like generally speaking, if if a system is like that, people will tell you that it's end to end. So by this definition, Caldi is not end to end. And uh, all of the others that I mentioned, uh, SpeechBrain, uh, ESPNet, and WeNet, those would be end to end. So in that case, the uh, probably we would say that the examples in Icefall are end to end. Uh, we most of the algorithms that we're that we're applying could be implemented in uh, Vero Python, but actually we do accelerate them with some C++ code. For instance, uh, we have some tricks to accelerate RNNT training that I'll describe later on. And, and we've implemented some fast RNNT decoding in Qt and C++. I don't, I, you may have noticed that I don't really like the term end to end. I don't think it's really meaningful. Uh, but basically, we, we want to have the best modern methods, and that may include things like RNNT that people will say it's end-to-end, -end. but maybe we'll modify it a little bit. Okay. Uh, wait, but before, I, before I go to this slide, let, let me say a bit more about, uh, about the general approach of, uh, of our tools. So we, we basically want to to build something that you could use in product and uh, and product have a lot of product has a lot of requirements that are not just word error rate. Like there's, there's uh, latency, there's customizability, there's like certain speed requirements and training and testing. So we're considering all of these things uh, and word error rate. Uh, so like I said, Icefall is the uh, 
is our recipes uh, repository. We have a lot of different recipes in there, but the one that we work mostly is the LibriSpeech one. That's the one that we mostly spend our time uh, improving. And then we copy the changes to other recipes. Uh, so because there's many different uh, example scripts in there, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of them. So you can go to GitHub and look for Icefall, just like look for Icefall in A2 FSA or just Icefall FSA, and you should easily find it. Uh, so this prune transducer stateless two, uh, we've got pretty good word error rates on this. We have a 2.6 on libre speech test clean without an, a language model. It's not the best that there is, but also it's very fast to train. Uh, so it's, we're not doing like some people like Google that they train for 700 epochs or something. We're normally training for a relatively small amount of time, like maybe 24 hours to 48 hours on maybe eight GPUs. So, uh, Basically, we're aiming our toolkit at people who have a not too crazy amount of hardware uh, to run with. Um, so, so this particular recipe, uh, it's an RNNT recipe. We have some tricks to make the RNNT training faster. And it's a modified version of the conformer encoder. Uh, the decoder is a, is a very simple decoder. It's a so-called stateless one that only sees two symbols of history. So it, it's going to be a bit more practical for certain uh, decoding algorithms. Uh, we also have uh, some recipes where we train with multiple different data sets. This could be used for multi-language, but right now it's all English at uh, this particular recipe. So we have a recipe with LibreSpeech plus GigaSpeech that we're getting 2% on test clean. So now for, for reference, I think uh, using the standard Cal Caldi script, about 3% is the best that we can do. And that's with language model rescoring. Uh, people have got better results with Caldi using much larger models down to around 2%. But that's with a lot of complicated things like language model or scoring. And people using various end-to-end -end methods have got even lower than 2%. People have gone down to uh, 1.8, something like that. Uh, but some of these things use like, you know, 100,000 hours of other databases and stuff like that. So if you're not Google or Facebook, it's a little bit hard to replicate some of those uh, some of those new results. And we're focusing on things that are as good as possible, but not super outrageous in terms of the amount of compute you need. Uh, so, so what's the vision of our, of our toolkit? Uh, we're basically aiming for product ready real time ASR, something that if you have a, a reasonable speech team, you can take these tools and uh, and build a product, something that has low latency and that's and that supports the normal things products have, like biasing words. Like if if someone wants to call their friend, you need to know the list of their friends. Uh, so there's certain there's certain requirements here that are not super easy to implement, especially with end to end. But we're working. We're working on it. Uh, we also need to support uh, efficient inference so that the server can have many parallel streams. We were originally working with uh, uh, with uh, transformer encoder decoder setups, uh, but we we uh, we kind of abandoned that because we decided that it was really too hard to have highly parallel inference. So we decided to focus on RNNT. Uh, we're, we're aiming to get something ready, kind of a demo level product by the end of this year, like 2022. Uh, but I'm, I'm personally committed to, uh, 
to getting something that, that Xiaomi can use in its products. And even if that doesn't happen by the end of 22, I'm definitely not going to leave Xiaomi before it happens, at least not vol voluntarily. Uh, so this, uh, this whole process has taken a bit longer than we originally expected. I was originally hoping when I came here that we could get this, we could have next gen Kali ready within a year. And it's, it's been much longer than that already. Uh, Uh, firstly, I've never been very good about uh, estimating how long things will take. This has been true with a lot of features in Caldi. Uh, there have also been some changes in direction. Now, we had a very early vision for this uh, next-gen Caldi that we were going to keep uh, most of the Caldi code base, but add a PyTorch, uh, basically add some PyTorch code for the modeling. But eventually I decided that this was not the right direction, that there was too much complexity in Caldi, that unless we just cut it out, it, it's never going to uh it's never going to be simple enough or elegant. So next we built this uh, toolkit called K2. And K2 is mostly for finite state automata algorithms. Uh and we were going our plan was to focus on things like CTC and lattice-free MMI. Now, we weren't really able to get the performance with CTC that we, uh, that we needed. Uh, and people these days, for the best systems, people are using mostly uh, transformer encoder-decoder models, or they're using RNNT. Uh, so... We initially were playing around with these uh, encoder-decoder models with attention. Uh, and the performance was okay. We're using things like what ESPNet uses. The performance was okay, word error rate-wise, but eventually we realized that, it, that the inference, the, the decoding, is just too difficult and it uses up too much GPU memory and that we would never be able to implement a uh, a practical server set up. So we moved on to RNNT, which actually most of the big companies are using RNNT for inference. Uh, we've seen things from Google, IBM, Microsoft, I think even Facebook, but I'm not sure. Maybe Facebook is not, but most of the big ones are using RNNT. So for the last uh, three or four months, we've been focusing on on RNNT, and we've uh, we have in a few novel things to accelerate the training. We've used our experience with GPU programming and some of our tools inside K2 to uh, implement this. K2 is still useful. It's not just for things like CTC. There's things like GPU-based lattice generation that are still very useful and lattice rescoring and things like that. So it's not a waste of time that. Uh, I want to talk ab about the underlying reason for the delay, what, why it's taken so long, uh, and what's so hard about the problem. So our basic goal from the start was to build open source speech recognition software that you can use to build products. So to fill a similar kind of niche as Caldi, a lot of companies use Caldi because it supports a real-time recognition that's efficient. But we want to use modern tools like PyTorch and TensorFlow and the best models. So now it's true that Caldi is no longer quite uh, state of the art in terms of word error rate. So if you look at the most recent papers, the people who are getting, you know, 2% on LibriSpeech, those are not for the most part using Caldi. Uh, but it's not super easy to take those new ideas and use them in product because something like Libri speech, it has some special characteristics that normally these, these systems don't consider latency. No one is doing real time decoding with these things like uh, conformers when they publish their papers. Uh, nobody is considering customization in Libri speech. The, the training and test data are very similar, right? Uh, 
So there's no issue of training on one data set and then trying to decode a different type of data, right? And that uh, customization is something that's quite hard to do with end-to-end models because uh, because the language model and the acoustic model are mixed together. So it's not super easy to do customization. And the third thing is speed, that some of these uh, big uh, re- recent models, things like Hubert or Wavtivec 2.0, they give really good performance, but you cannot use them in product because they're too slow and they use up too much memory. So now you can solve all of the above problems, but the problem is once you solve those problems, if you solve them in the easy way, most of the performance improvement is gone. So you're back to the same improvement. Sorry, you're back to the same performance as Caldi if you want good latency and so on. So then you can ask, why did we do all this? Was it just a waste of time? So in my opinion, there's no use for us to recommend to replace some old product with something that is not better, right? It needs to be better, and it needs to be enough better that it's worthwhile to switch over to it. So that's what we're really uh, uh, trying to do. So... So why use next-gen Kali? This question is directed to people, maybe in other companies, who uh, are considering different speech tools and kind of want to decide which one to get experience in. So here's my reasons why you should consider using next-gen Kali. First, I think we have a great team, uh, and we're making very fast progress towards productizable ASR. And this is something that, the two most popular alternatives, ESPNet and uh, SpeechBrain, they're, they're great projects and they, they're doing a lot, but I don't see a lot of uh, emphasis on things like real-time issues and customization. They have a slightly more uh, academic focus, meaning that they're they're more geared to, towards people doing research maybe less towards product. Uh, another thing is that those other toolkits are mostly just working at the Python level, but our team has the capability to uh, go down into C++ and CUDA, and that gives us a lot more flexibility to implement new things. We're already getting very good results. I, I spoke about some okay results on LibreSpeech. We actually have the best results that I'm aware of on WeNet. Uh, I, I, uh, at least we're better than the, the ESP net numbers that we know about. That's a 10,000 hour database of Chinese. Sorry, not we net. Uh, what's it called? Uh, we speech. What's that big Chinese database that, that Ming Shang was reporting results on? Uh, it's not we net. It has we in it. Uh, sorry. I'm terrible with names. Uh, but anyway, the, the the point is that that we have uh, we have pretty good results. Uh, our development style is very open. We always answer questions very fast. Although other teams are good too in that respect, and we're the only team that's backed by a big company that's uh, developing open source solutions and intending to support productization. Now there are some great open source efforts from people like. Facebook and Google, but usually they stop a long way before you can build a real product because they don't really want to give away their, you know, secrets or whatever. Uh, and of course, the, the researchers want to be helpful, but the, the policy doesn't doesn't let them do that. Oh yeah, so the database is called WeNet Speech that I was talking about. I believe we have the best results on that, but of course, we don't know what everyone else is doing, so I don't want to make any claims that are too strong. Uh, I think we might even, we have very competitive results on AI shell too, I believe. I don't recall the exact numbers, I'm sorry. Okay, so how do you use NextGen Caldi? What I would do, if you want to have a look, is just go to Icefall. And when you try to install Icefall, it'll direct you how to install 
K2 and load C and other requirements. Now, just like Caldi in the early days, this is not necessarily going to be super, super easy to install. There's issues with like getting the right PyTorch version that's compatible with your, with your, your CUDA toolkit and things like that. Also, it's best if you have GPUs that have a lot of memory, like at least 24 gig or 32 gig, because our recipes use quite large models. So if, if your GPU has very little memory, you'll be forced to use a very small mini batch size. This, this is not an issue that's specific to our tools. Uh, other tools like ESPNet or SpeechBrain will have the same issue because they use very similar, uh, model topologies. And I do recommend to look at the traffic on GitHub, meaning look at the pull requests and so on to see what we're doing and which recipes we're using because there are some older recipes in there that we don't necessarily recommend. Uh, if you have any problems or questions, you can create an issue on GitHub and we always respond fast to that. Or you can email us. Uh, my email is very easy to find. So, uh, cool. So now, like I said, time permitting, I was going, and time does permit, it seems. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our recent technical work. So these are basically some papers that we that we submitted to Interspeech, and they're coming up soon. Uh, and this is to give you just a flavor of what the kinds of things that we're doing. So the first thing is pruned training for RNNT. Now, RNNT, RNNT training can be a little bit slow because it in involves a uh, recursion over frames and over symbols. So it's a two-dimensional recursion and each item in the recursion is a little bit uh, non-trivial. And this can dominate the training time if the vocabulary is large. And there's also a problem of memory usage. So, uh, so this, is a, this is a visualization that on the right is the 2D recursion. Uh, and we, and that figure on the left, we're trying to demonstrate that when the system is training okay, after it's been trained a bit, only some elements in that 2D matrix are important. Like on, on, only some positions in, in that basically on the diagonal contribute to the likelihood in a significant way. So if we can limit our computation to that diagonal, near diagonal, we can make it much faster. So basically, our method is to uh, to to use a fast uh, joiner. RNNT has this joiner thing. To use a fast joiner to figure out which parts of the matrix are important, and then evaluate the the full joiner with just the important uh, frames or just the important uh, uh, positions in that matrix. So this is a table from our paper. On the left, that the table shows uh, the time taken, showing it's like 10 times faster than the others, and the peak memory usage. Of course, this is just for the core RNNT computation. It doesn't include the encoder. So uh, even though it's 10 times faster, it just means that the RNNT <coughs> core computation is not significant anymore but the overall training could still be a little bit slow because the encoder is big. Uh, and the word error rate, this is, oh, I have to move so you can see this. Uh, the, on the right-hand table, it shows uh, some word error rates were actually better than the baseline. Uh, our, our numbers is on the top, the pruned RNNT. It's a bit better because Basically, this pruned RNNT has a has a simple joiner. Uh, and uh, we use that just as an as a smoothing term. Also, it's quite a bit faster. It's about two times faster. That's the overall training time. Uh, the next thing, the next paper is a fast and parallel decoding method. 
basically we're using uh, some of our utilities in K2, which is all about ragged tensors, to implement uh, a very fast version of RNNT training. So basically we're moving the RNNT training loop from Python into CUDA and doing it in a highly parallel way. So this is an alternative to the traditional beam search method for RNNT. And you, using this method, we can then do things like lattice rescoring. So again, this is a table from the paper. The details are not super important here. Let me, let me see what's important. Uh, firstly, the decoding time is much less. That graph on the right shows that our decoding time is like uh, way less than the others. Uh, the others are slow because they're loops in Python. Uh, and also our results are better because these are actually some things related to pruned RNNT, certain types of smoothing that we're doing. So anyway, this the details here are not important, just to give you an idea of, what, of what's going on. Uh, we have another paper about distillation, kind of teacher-student learning using vector quantization uh, indices. The basic idea is that instead of using a loss like L1 or L2 to, to learn from a teacher model, we, uh, we compress the teacher model's embeddings using codebooks, and we predict the codebook indexes. Uh, so this has some efficiency benefits as well as working a little better. So that's that. So basically, we're getting better results uh, for a particular setup. I'm afraid these absolute word error rates are not great uh, because our our 100 hour libre speech system is not super well tuned. Uh, not a lot, people don't tend to optimize the 100 hour setup because the the popular recipes for things like RNNT and conformer and so on tend to be optimized for big data. So, but anyway, the the point is this method is working better than the standard distillation methods. Okay, so, uh, oh, so in future, we hope to use this for our own version of unsupervised training to modify something like Hubert to use this VQ stuff instead of L1 or L2. But, uh, you know, we'll see if that works. So I think I'm going to end this talk a little bit early and have, what? I thought that was what you said. Maybe not. <laughs> I think I went through these slides a lot quicker than I thought I would. So we actually have time for uh, for quite a lot of questions. Uh, so I don't know if people have questions or perhaps we can have some kind of discussion. Uh, so, I mean, the summary is we're building this, we're building this next gen Kali stuff. We're aiming for production ready software, but that isn't fully ready yet. Uh, and it's all uh, open source and you can, it would be great if people can start using Icefall and, you know, making pull requests and uh, reporting bugs and things like that, because that will help us to move faster. Uh, I've given you a flavor of some of our recent, uh, some of our recent work. And I think that's it. I'm sorry, guys, that I uh, moved on a lot faster than I uh, than I was supposed to. I have a tendency to do this when I give talks. Uh, but let's see if we have some questions, and maybe we can just start uh, Eugene's talk a little bit uh, a little bit sooner than we thought. Okay, so here's one question. Uh, if we have end-to-end -end ASR, is it still necessary to do speech? signal processing before ASI. Okay, so I guess the question is, do, do we still need uh, MFCCs or MEL filter banks? So there have been a lot of papers showing that you can get rid of that signal processing, that it's definitely possible to learn the features from scratch. Uh, we are actually still using MEL filter banks. And here's why it's mostly to do with with the uh, compression and bandwidth. 
because I'm not aware of any paper that really definitively shows that you can do better than log mill filter banks if you have enough filter banks, if you have like 80. A lot of people show that they can do the same, but uh, actually doing better is really hard. And a lot of the papers in, in conferences like NIPS that claim to show that they have something better, they're not really using a full system and they're not really doing doing a reasonable comparison. So I don't feel strongly about the signal processing stuff. The only reason we're keeping it for now is because uh, it allows you to load the data from disk much faster. Because right now GPUs are so fast that if if you uh, if you don't save the the Mel Kepstrom, if you load the WAV data, uh, you're going to be limited by bandwidth unless you have a very very fast network connection. Yeah. So the next question is, what makes the training with next gen Caldi faster? Can you explain some contributions about the acceleration? So there's. There's a lot of different things, and we're working on more things. One, one big thing is the, the RNNT. We re-implemented RNNT to, uh, uh, with that pruned RNNT thing, so that in this, uh, oh, I'm looking weird in this. Okay, is it like, okay, there we go. In that, okay, I'm going to forget the, the fingers. In the 2D matrix, uh, we're not evaluating the whole matrix, we're evaluating just the diagonal. Uh, and there's a lot of other things. We're using uh, we're using a 16-bit floats. This, this is a PyTorch feature called uh, FP16. Uh, and we kind of reworked the conformer encoder, uh, replacing the, uh, the layer norm with something simpler and faster and making a few other changes that make it about 10% faster. And we did a lot of work on the data loader with load C to load the data as fast as possible. Uh, what else? We, we, uh, we messed with the learning rate schedules and the optimizer so that uh, we don't need so many epochs so that we can get good results in like 30 epochs instead of 60. So that's a big help. So it's a lot of little things. What's the plan for online decoding or streaming in K2? So the way that I would ask this is what's the plan for online decoding or streaming in Icefall? Because this is a recipe level thing. It's not really an algorithm level thing. So we're working very actively on this right now. Right now we're, we're working with... Um, a variant of the M former. An M former is a recent work from, I, I don't know if it's Facebook or Google or what, I forget. But one of those big companies, it's, it's a streaming version of the conformer encoder. So we're working with, with variants of that and we, we're trying to, we're trying to improve the word error rate for these systems because if you just simply implement the streaming conformer with chunks or whatever, the word error rate can go up from like 2.5% to 4% or something on Libre Speech Test Clean. So there's a fairly big penalty, and we're trying to reduce this penalty as much as possible. Uh, but so I'm hoping to have this like easy to use and kind of polished by well before the end of this year. So maybe September, I'm hoping. Oh, okay, the next question. Dear Dan, what do you think is the future development direction of speech recognition? Is WFST necessary? Hmm. Well, I mean, I don't think WFSTs are necessary if it's just a question of word error rate. Like, let's say if you're doing Libre speech uh, and you have matched training and test data, you can probably do something like RNNT with a neural language model. You don't really need WFST. 
Uh, WFST is just a tool that you can sometimes use to make things a little bit faster or more convenient. So we can use WFST ideas to implement lattice generation for things like RNNT or CTC. And this can let us do things like language model rescoring easier. Uh, and if you don't use lattices, you have to use n lists, and those are like, they don't scale well to longer utterances. So I, I, I don't, I'm not saying that, that WFSTs are something that will be super important or central to the way we think about it, but I think we'll still use them for a few little things like <clears throat> maybe system rescoring or something like that. So I, we we still plan to use them, but we not we're not going to be limited by them. If there's some better algorithm, we'll definitely use that. Uh, the stateless predictor mentioned is that the embedding predictor. Uh, I don't recall the the terminology from the original paper. I think it might be what it is is that. The, the predictor in RNNT, also known as the decoder, it only sees two symbols of history instead of infinite symbols. And uh, basically each uh, BPE token or whatever your symbol is, has an embedding vector. And and the, the actual encoder is very simple. I think it's just like a, uh, a 1D convolution with num, with num uh, channels equal to the... Uh, embedding dimension. Sorry, num groups equal, equal to the embedding dimension, so it's very fast. Uh, how to make conformer work in streaming? Well, I mean, that's kind of what I've been talking about right now with the mformer and so on. So you definitely have to make compromises because the conformer does benefit from future context. And if you get rid of future context, you definitely lose some performance. But it's a question of finding the right trade-off. So we're working, we're mostly working with M former right now. And we've been changing it to add uh, relative position encoding. We're trying to add back the convolution layers into it because I think the original people took them out uh, and things like that. Does alignment help for ET, ETE models? Uh, well, okay. Well, I think it's in the nature of end-to-end -end that you don't really need alignments. But there may still be certain cases where the alignments are useful or it's a useful concept to have, maybe soft alignments. So in our, uh, in our first, uh, Fast RNNT, uh, the fast RNNT training, the pruned RNNT, we uh, we have something that's similar to alignments because we we get these uh, posteriors in, in the kind of two dimensional matrix of symbols by frames, and we work out which frames are important for different symbols, and you could view that as a soft alignment. So, <coughs> in that sense, it's a kind of alignment but we're not using hard alignments. And in general, we want to avoid needing too much things like alignments. Uh, why is it so difficult? Oh, no, that question is, okay. How to trade off the resource consumption during model training and inference with the final performance of the model? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a difficult thing. We're doing the best we can in various ways. So firstly, we're not, we're not focusing too much on these really huge models like, like Hubert and Weft Effect. We are, we are trying to find ways to use them to do things like train smaller models. But we don't think that a model with, you know, a billion parameters is going to be super practical for training unless we figure out a way to make it much faster. Uh, also, for inference speed, we are putting a lot of effort right now in inference speed, doing these things like pruned RNNT, because we feel that if we focus on that now, it'll be much easier in future to 
get word error rate gains because our experiments will run faster. Uh, is there an example of customization in Icefall slash K2? Uh, that is something that we are going to be working on in the near future. We want to have a, uh, we're trying to build a kind of, uh, some kind of data set or evaluation protocol that we can, that to create a standard way to measure customization performance. You know, create a bunch of uh, tasks based on something like LibriSpeech, where you have to do customization to do well. Uh, but there are no examples just yet. We're going to work on it soon. Why is it so difficult for Shao Ai to record a young girl's normal pronunciation when she's about four years old? So, yeah, speech recognition systems always have it have difficulty with uh, with young children. Now, I, I think so. Part of it is that young children just don't speak very clearly, but that's not the whole thing. Uh, I think part of it, if you ask this question in the United States and it was that American company, I would say that part of the reason is that there's laws in the USA and Europe that make it very difficult to deal with children's data such that it's very, very hard to acquire databases of children's speech. So it makes it very difficult to train ASR systems for children. I don't know, actually, if there are rules like that in China or if that's even a problem. Uh, but speech recognition systems have always struggled with children's speech. Have you ever thought about connecting Caldi and K2? Uh, well, I mean, I'm open to it, but it's not really a super big priority right now. So... NVIDIA has done some good work in accelerating Caldi's uh, decoding algorithms. They've written some GPU code that I don't fully understand. You know, they have some very smart guys there who know GPUs a lot. Uh, I don't think we... It would be very difficult to do better than what those guys did. Uh, part of the advantage of K2 is that it lets you write fast GPU algorithms, even if you have a relatively small understanding of GPUs. So we have these concepts like ragged tensors, that once you understand the ragged tensor concept, you can implement a lot of things fairly fast in K2 without being some kind of genius GPU programmer. Uh, but because NVIDIA already implemented decoding in Caldi on GPU, maybe it's not necessary for Caldi right now. Uh, I noticed that each icefall recipe has its own version of the script, kind of messy. Can those be unified like uh, Caldi? That's a good question. Uh, so we kind of made a conscious decision that at this stage in the development of icefall, that we would not uh, that we would not have centralized scripts unless something is very standard. And and the reason why is that we want to make fast progress. And the problem is, if if you centralize scripts for something like, uh, let's say, the conformer encoder, every time you make a change to the encoder, you have to worry about back compatibility. You have to worry about how do we load models with the old format. And maintaining that code becomes very difficult. Now, at some point, we probably will share the scripts or figure out a better way to... Uh, to propagate these changes from one recipe to the other. But I'm a little bit cautious about seeing uh, the direction that ESPNet and, uh, and SpeechBrain went in. I mean, they're great toolkits, but they're very config-driven. And I think that's maybe also a problem with Caldi. The problem is that, uh, you know, they, they have these config files that support a lot of different options. And it makes it harder to understand the code because you have to understand how the config file relates to the code and the code can be in many different places. So, I mean, that's kind of why we kept the script separate so far. But 
maybe in a few months when things are a bit more stable, it will be the right time to centralize some things. Uh, is there any plan about continuous speech recognition? Well, I think this question might possibly be misphrased or maybe it's mistranslated. Like continuous speech recognition, normally that means just connected speech, like I'm speaking now. Uh, and we do already support that and all speech setups support that. Okay, let's go to a different question. Uh, Hey, Daniel just mentioned it's very hard to apply technologies to new products. Can you share some specific difficulties and uh, solutions? Thank you very much. Hmm. This is a difficult question to, to answer. Uh, I think what I was talking about is that some of these fancy new methods like RNT or, or uh, things like that, they have great word error rate on something like Libre speech, a, a pre prepared database. But uh, they're not so easy to put into a product because they use a lot of future, future context uh, and for other reasons too. I, I'm, I was just making the point that it's a lot of work uh, and we're working on it. Okay. Have you worked on discriminative training in the K2 framework? What's your opinion in general? So we have done some work with Lattice Free MMI. I, we, I was a bit disappointed that we did not see the same kind of improvements with Lattice Free MMI that we did in Caldi. And, you know, there's many differences, you know, in the model structure and the, in how we train the training algorithm, things like that. Sometimes it's difficult to know why something didn't really work. But I, I, do, I do plan to put some attention on discriminative training in future. Like if by discriminative training we mean things that require lattices or things that require considering alternative likely hypotheses, I think there's some room to improve RNNT by using that kind of thing. So... I'm hoping to do something like that in the near future. We'll see if it works. Why is RNNT slow when training? Uh, I mean, the basic reason is that uh, the the time taken, it, there's this part of it that's kind of uh, number of symbols times number of frames times vocabulary size. So if your utterances are long, and your vocabulary size is large, like in Chinese, then it can become very slow and use too much memory. But our approved RNNT does take out uh, one of those one of those three factors, so it makes it a lot faster. Advices for learning PyTorch. Uh, so, when I first started learning PyTorch. Uh, I became very frustrated because I, I could never find documentation that explained how something was supposed to work. And so I think I, I came from a C++ universe where you don't, you don't really just play around with code. You normally find documentation to explain what the interface is. And a lot of the documentation of PyTorch is extremely vague. Often you have to actually run the code you know, to test out the code to see what it really does. And for a long time, I, I didn't really fully accept that. I just made myself angry by saying, why is there no documentation? Or why is the documentation so unclear? But more recently, I've just kind of accepted the way Python toolkits often are, or the way people work in Python, that you just get a prompt and you try it out. And if you have a, if something is not working, you just use PDB or something. It's very easy to, easy to debug. Uh, so I think once you accept that, it becomes much easier. It seems Shao Ai is difficult to understand the local dialect. Hmm. This is, uh, this is always an issue in Chinese speech recognition that, uh, 
so it's not always clear uh, for a company like which local dialects they should support. Sometimes we will support some dialects but not others, and it could be that your particular local dialect is just very obscure. Like if there's a dialect that only like two million people speak, uh, most companies are not going to support that. I, you know, I'm sorry. In in Western countries, people would get angry about this. They would say it's discrimination. But uh, <laughs> okay, what what's the next? Uh, uh, no, no, we did that. How to reduce uh, false alarm rate as low as possible in, key, in key, keyword search? Well, this is a difficult question because it's equivalent to asking how do you do good keyword search? Because it's all about false alarms versus uh, versus um, misses, right? I don't think I have any good insights. Uh, Okay, is it possible to use Hubert to replace handmade features? Well, I don't really see Hubert as a, as a, uh, oh, I just noticed that I was supposed to go into until 7.50. Okay, people are telling me I can answer one or two more questions. Uh, is it possible to use Hubert to replace handmade features? Uh, I don't really see Hubert as a replacement for things like MFCC because Hubert is a very, very large model, right? So you're kind of, I mean, yes, you could use Hubert activations uh, the same way that you would use MFCC, but it's already very, very slow. Um, and people, not normally when people use Hubert, I think they fine-tune the model itself to output whatever they want, like, you know, some kind of soft max. Uh, what about WeNet, the framework that's popular right now? Yeah, I think I think WeNet is good. Like, we're doing some things a little bit different, but I, you know, I think the WeNet team is great, and and some of our group, you know, they know those guys because they used to work at at Mobvoi. Uh, I I don't follow it super closely though. Someone said, I'm curious, why did you decide to join Xiaomi? So I uh, Xiaomi had already demonstrated some support for open source. Uh, like uh, one of the executives here about Cho had, uh, you know, has talked a lot about open source and was very supportive of me, uh, me coming here. Uh, and I wanted a company that was stable because a lot of these big internet companies uh, you don't know what they're going to be doing in one or two years. They could easily change their mind and say, uh, actually, we don't want you to work on open source speech technology. We want you to uh, work on this product now. Right. I think the culture, a lot of these in internet companies is like that. So I was, I didn't want that to happen. How do you see the future of next gen Caldi? in the field of autonomous driving. Well, I mean, of course, we're hoping to get, once our product stuff is really working, we hope for this to be used in, uh, in you know, uh, autonomous cars and stuff. But you got to understand about uh, the way self-driving cars work, that the speech uh, capability is always going to be very separate from the driving capability. You can never really make the driving functionality dependent on speech because speech recognition is too inaccurate, right? You don't want to say, oh, turn left, and it just turns left into a field. So so I, I do hope that this stuff will be used in self-driving cars, or, but it's a separate issue. Uh, any, any plan to support two-pass decoding like Google or WeNet? Well... I mean, we're already investigating a bunch of two-pass things because when we decode, we mostly decode to lattices and you can easily rescore those. So yeah, we, we are uh, we are considering two-pass methods. Uh, uh, 
uh, okay. Hello, Daniel. Could you tell me about the biggest block of developing state of the art open source ASR from your view? Uh, I think the biggest difficulty right now is that the field is, is moving very fast. Back, back when we developed CalD, uh, things didn't change quite as rapidly and we didn't have to spend so much time catching up. These days, it seems that every few months, uh, something new and interesting comes out and we're constantly changing our scripts and trying new things. I mean, it's good. It's nice to be in a fast moving field but it's also very challenging. And we have a lot of competition too. There's other people developing very good toolkits, but we are determined to uh, to focus on this uh, productizability issue and make something that people can use in their products. So I, I think my part of the talk might be uh, done, guys. Uh, next, uh, Eugene is going to... Uh, speak. So it seems that you can go to Weibo and ask questions. Uh, wait, wait. My my Weibo name is my full name. So Daniel Povey. You can find me on there and I'll answer the questions on there. So I believe uh, oh, click to exit. I, I have to go to Tencent and unshare so that you can and share. Okay, here we go. Okay, thank you guys. I'm going to turn off my camera and microphone now. Okay, Eugene, you go. <laughs>